So welcome everyone. My name is Joe Ford. I work at the Institute of Modern Languages Research uh, as a lecturer in French studies and I uh, have the pleasure of convening this series um, on world literature and translation which is co-convened with the London Institute, sorry, the London Intercollegiate Network for Comparative Studies links and the Institute of Modern Languages Research. And the series really has aimed to think with, to probe and to um, deconstruct definitions of world literature and to look across different linguistic and cultural contexts and what these contexts bring uh, to our understanding of the world and how they might challenge uh, some of the dominant definitions around world literature uh, and, and translation too. I'm delighted uh, to welcome our speaker today, uh, who really, I think, ex exemplifies this work, decentering definitions of world literature. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to uh, point out that today's session is being recorded. Uh, so if, if you don't wish to appear on the recording, then just make sure your camera's off. Um, any questions or comments you'd like to make, you can just pop them in the chat. Uh, and I'll pick up on those in, in the Q&A at the end. Um, the chat is open, so you can uh, post in the chat uh, any comments or questions as we go along. And again, we'll pick up on those in the Q&A at the end. Um, so uh, to our speaker, uh, uh, Clarissa Vierke is Professor of Literatures in African Languages at the University of Beirut. And she's an expert in Swahili poetry, manuscript cultures, and has been working on traveling texts in East Africa, both in Anglophone Kenya and Tanzania and Lusophone Mozambique. Together with colleagues working on Francophone and Lusophone literature, she's currently running a research project on literary entanglements in the Indian Ocean across boundaries of nations, languages, and media. At the moment, uh, Clarissa is finalizing a critical edition of poetry by the Kenyan Islamic scholar and intellectual Mahmoud Mao. She's principal investigator of the Cluster of Excellence Africa Multiple, Reconfiguring African Studies, and the spokesperson of the research section, Arts and Aesthetics. Uh, together with colleagues from Leipzig and Cologne, she set up the project Recalibrating Africanistic, uh, which is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, with the aim to critically consider the future of the study uh, of African languages uh, and uh, literatures. And um, Clarissa uh, is going to speak today for around 45 minutes, and then we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion afterwards. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Clarissa. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Joseph, for having me. And um, thank you to everyone in the team for organizing um, such an amazing series of lectures and then also inviting me to contribute. It's a real pleasure and honor. Um, let me share my screen, first of all. <laughs> let me find my presentation. Um, yes, I think. Can you see what I see? <laughs> Can you see my PowerPoint? All right, perfect. Um, yeah, I want to start um, today and think about world literature and how on the one hand it's, it can denote actually, it could denote actually quite a welcoming um, project, um, whereas in practice, uh, world literature and particularly its worldliness has mostly been measured primarily with reference to Western modernity. So literary history has often been written in, in rather unilineal ways and mostly taking the West and, and the novel as written in a few European languages as the only starting point and often also the end point um, of the investigation. So uh, while well, this is all not really new to you, the, and, and you all know that there has been like a growing call as well um, for the inclusion of other languages from beyond the West and of a vari variety of genres. And I, I don't think I need to mention all critics. I just really want to refer to Francesca Orsini's um, criti critical and very inspiring voice. And I also really want to thank her personally um, for all the conversations we've had and, and all the, the support as well. Um, thanks a lot, Francesca. Uh, so her multilingual, local, and also significant geography, so ways of circulating not only centered on the West, so ways texts circulate not only 
in the West and also including a longer historical perspective, not just the last 200 years or for Africa, mostly the last 50 years of literary modernity. Well, this also reopens really discussions about what literature is as also um, Galintianov uh, underlines. So I quote him, there is today still an unresolved tension in the way we approach world literature in that our modern understanding of it has become too secular and too determined by attention exclusively in the written form they have assumed. This is wanting on two accounts. First, it, it excludes huge verbal masses of the pre-modern epochs and secondly, it impedes efforts to capture the pluralism of world literature beyond a Eurocentric vision. So he argues for actually taking a variety of what he calls modi existendi of world literature into consideration and also refers even to the well, very often quoted reference Goethe's uh, notion of world literature, uh, which also partly goes beyond the categorization into oral and written forms and rather insists on verbal creativity in, well, in all its variety, if you want. So African literature is so famously rich uh, for its oral traditions and not merely actually of the past, but so far it has been very little explored in challenging also um, narrow notions of world literature. There are exceptions. I think um, if we think of very important works by Sara Matsagora, for instance, but in, on the whole, I think um, there's a lot that, that could be said and um, looking at, at African literature still. So two trends have actually further added to what Levine recently called the effacement of, of oral literature. So on the one hand, and this is also pointed out, has been pointed out by Sarah Matsagora. So on the one hand, there is the paradigm of globalization and also the focus on transcultural identities, um, which, which actually has given much more emphasis to the African diaspora and again, prose writing mostly. So works, for instance, by the latest generations of the so-called Afropolitans, like, for, well, I think um, most notably probably Chimamanda Adichie, they have, and, and her works um, have also fed into discussions of world literature. So highlighting Africanness and drawing on black consciousness rhetoric with a cosmopolitan attitude, also the biographies of the authors and their narratives, they suggest an emancipation from the essentializing narratives of Africa as disconnected from the rest of the world. I mean, this is the worldliness, so to say, that comes in. But nonetheless, and this has also been criticized, Western literary institutions and readership and the book market and its preferred genre, again, the novel, and here typically again in English, have remained then the points of reference for measuring global reach or here the cosmopolitanness. So the more worldly it seems African literature becomes, the more, as it also seems, African languages and the variety of literary forms seem to be relegated to the background or um, to the past. And this has also, I mean, in another paradigm or for another kind of development has also been pointed out by Karen Baba or already quite a while ago for the post-colonial paradigm as well, which has also imposed a similar kind of teleological history, although having not the same kind of um, roots like the Afropolitan discussion. But still, it created a rigid dichotomy between traditional oral literature on the one hand, so in African languages, and then on the other hand, moral literature, mostly written in the former colonial languages and the traditional lang literature in African languages then becomes rather a thing of a primordial past or in an equally difficult way, the oral has become a rather unquestioned but celebrated um, sign of African cultural authenticity. You know? um, so also feeding into the novel, but, but um, how it feeds into the novel, what it does um, is seldomly actually really uh, researched. So this is, these are just two points of departures for, for my book pro project, um, where you have the title here, The Shifting Shores, so Swahili literature, world literature, and then in the book I also make reference actually to discussions about the Indian Ocean, which I will not talk too much about today. So the idea is really to question teleological and Western-centered notions of African literature without, again, also losing literary entanglements out of sight. And I think um, Swahili literature can actually could, can offer <laughs> quite some interesting alternative perspectives. And I hope I'm not only saying so because um, as um, Joe already said, I'm an expert in 
in, in that field, but looking at the different worlds, and I'm just here bringing you two different maps. So um, Swahili was part of different colonial empires. So you have the Anglophone, Anglophone Kenya, Tanzania, but also Lusophone Mozambique, the Belgian Congo, the Francophone Comoros. Um, and as well, on the other hand, you have Indian Ocean networks, which reach back to the first millennium. And, um, and of course, it's also a literary language in the Western as well as in the Eastern, in the Eastern diaspora. So um, its ecologies, as I think one, one could say, can offer a perspective uh, which post-colonial and world literature debates often do not take into uh, too much into reconsideration. And they actually tend to reinforce rather the boundaries of colonial empire. So if we tend to speak about the Francophone versus, for instance, Anglophone literature, or very seldomly actually as well, um, Lusophone literature, we again fall back into kind of monolingual and national um, philologies. So I he think here, so to say, um, looking at Swahili maps um, and changing maps as well, one can in a sense um, try to decenter, or it, it's a way of decentering these Western perspectives, um, first of all, taking, so to say, a different map, a different language as a, as a starting point. So um, in the book, I'm kind of moving along um, the Swahili coast and also into um, with excursions also into the African mainland and different nation states, as well as some Indian Ocean post um, port cities and, and the diaspora. And I'm, I'm trying to, to kind of trace different transoceanic, transcontinental and um, transnational actually relations, which in which Swahili literature has imagined itself, or also the maps, so to say, which Swahili literature um, has imagined. And it also spans um, a period, I'm, I'm trying to cover a period from the 17th to the, to the 21st century in a variety of media. So oral and handwritten poetry and Arabic script, colonial newspaper poetry, and then in the 21st century as well, um, the, diasporic, um, the diasporic novel. And in each chapter, I'm trying to so show how um, a Swahili literary genre is actually implicated in different technologies, media, and genres, um, which are kind of a starting point for me, and how they connect to Arabic, English, um, and Portuguese, and also German, um, German literature to some extent. So I'm, I'm trying to study Swahili literature basically in terms of very dynamic um, relations. And this means again, and this is why these maps are again misleading in a sense, not to uh, replace clear cut maps with other clear cut maps, but rather to see how these maps actually overlap, how they are dynamic, how they are also simultaneous and um, yeah, persist and reappear as probably Mbembe would, would call that African modes of, of self-writing um, in very, very different ways. So today, what I want to um, show you today is actually I'm, I'm going to take you to something that is related to one chapter that talks about the colonial imagination and the imagination of colonial empires and the colonial encounter. In this chapter, I'm actually going to German, Portuguese, and later British um, East Africa, where lots of Swahili poetry was produced. On the one hand, praising the colonizer. Here, an example from German East Africa. On the right-hand side, you find an early newspaper where you have a poem celebrating the Kaiser's, the emperor's birthday. <laughs> and on the left, actually quite a critical poem um, by a very prominent poet of the time, Hemedi el Bukhri, who um, criticized actually the German occupation of what is called the Mrima coast, so the coast around um, Dar es Salaam, where he prays in a sense um, to God, protect us, your servants, in the war against our against your enemies. So these are the Germans who reject your religion and prevent us to worship um, the mighty. So two different, uh, so to say, very different reactions to. Uh, to the colonial encounter. And of course, there's much more to say about this. I'm not going to talk too much about German East Africa today, but I rather want to take you to a small town in Northern Mozambique, um, Angosh, and introduce you as well to a poem which has um, an interesting title because it has the Kaiser, the German Kaiser as the title, and it narrates World War I. Um, and together with my colleague, Shapani Motiwa, whom I also um, thank a lot, a Mozambican historian, we actually found the poem when we were working on different 
uh, poetry in in Arabic um, in Arabic script in the region. And we we were quite curious. We were we wanted to know about this poem that everybody was talking about. That obviously talked about World War One and had this title of the of the German Kaiser around 500 kilometers away from the border to German East Africa. And that was still being performed um, in 2015 when we last came to the um, to the region. But before I talk about the poem, let me shortly give you an idea um, of World War I. So the world in the term, the first world war, um, has a similar problem like the term world in world literature, because it has mostly been used actually to refer to Europe. So the famous trench battles. But uh, critical historians in the last 20 years have actually um, underlined that the Great War, as it's also called, was less a war of nations than actually one of colonial empires. So not only have non-Europeans, Asians and African soldiers been part of the horrors of the European battles, but the wars also took very much part outside of the West, so East Africa here included. Articulating the war's connections with colonialism and by including African perspectives on the war, that has become a very important concern for historians. And also to go beyond um, stark dichotomies of um, European, so to say, uh, perspectives on the one hand and local discourses on the other. So for instance, in a very classical um, book by uh, Frederick Cooper, um, he argues very much for a more kind of searching imagination also of the efforts of the colonized intellectuals to work across the, the colony and metropole divide, um, to also go beyond, beyond these dichotomies. Um, and Angosh, so the small town in, in Mozambique, actually um, seems to speak a lot to these, um, to these concerns. So this is a colonial uh, map of East Africa. Angosh, you find it in the green part, Portuguese East Africa. The orange is German East Africa. And everything that is pink or pinkish is um, British East Africa. So to the left of, um, to the east, uh, to the west, sorry, of Portuguese East Africa is British um, British Nyasa land, and that's in fact also what dominated the region of Angosh much more actually in, in a real sense, not even the British um, government or protectorate, but the British Nyasa company, um, which was kind of very influential in the region of Angosh much more than actually um, Portuguese colonial powers in the, in the 20th century. Um, Angosh nowadays is um, a very small village. It was bombed to the size of a village during the Mozambican Civil War and is really very much now part, um, really on the margin of the Mozambican nation state. But it used to be a very important Swahili Sultanate uh, from the 15th century onwards with lots of connections to other towns all along the coast and also um, across the Indian Ocean. It, had it sat at the edge of actually, as I already said, several empires. So Portuguese East Africa and British Nyasa land, I already mentioned it, but then um, during the First World War, this um, Northern Mozambique became the most embattled kind of zone between um, uh, German East African soldiers, mostly African soldiers, and um, against, so to say, um, um, the, against the British alliance and uh, involving then later also Rhodesian and South African troops. So it might seem, so to say, very much in the heartland of Portuguese East Africa, but during the First World War, it was very much um, a battle zone where <laughs> different empires um, actually met. Well, I do not want to, and I'm, I'm now going to show you, I'm, I'm not only interested in how the Kaiser actually reflects, the poem reflects all these political maps, but I'm very much interested, and I hope I can show this today, um, that, um, well, building actually on Eric Hyatt's notion that um, literary worlds, the world is also created in narratives, and a narrative is an approach to worlds. So the poem relates to the experience of the First World War, certainly in East Africa, but it is not a documentation of it, but rather narrates its own version of, of the First World War. So the world is very much an effect um, of the poem, but I'm, I'm going to come back to that. The Kaiser, now I'm going to talk about the poem finally. <laughs> The Kaiser is, is a poem that is still being recited in northern Mozambique. Um, it, well, I mean, most probably came into being, was first written down at the beginning of the 20th century. We don't know by whom. 
and then it was passed down in Arabic script. But again, orality and writtenness do not exclude each other. It's basically a poem to be performed, not to be read. On the right hand side, you find one of the most important copyists of the region, Fundi Haliti, who was also um, a performer. It's a very long poem, 1,500 stanzas in Hit the Book He Holds, uh, which is actually a colonial administrative registrar, which was left, and he used the columns to write down the very strict prosody of the poem, because it's narrative on the one hand, but it's also written in a, in a strict um, prosody. A recitation of it could take something between three nights and, and ten nights, depending on, so to say, if you, if you kind of perform the long or the, the short version. Um, so, so when we went there, so to say, they reduced it to three nights, not, not the long version of ten. Um, yeah, what is the poem about? Um, at the beginning of the poem, um, the king of the world, uh, mind you, the world again, so the Sultan of Istanbul invites all pagan kings um, of the world to a banquet. So there is the German Kaiser, the British king, the king Yi, and the French Napoleon, Lapoleon, but also the Japanese, the Austrians, the Belgians, the Russians, the Bulgarians, and the Americans. They're all called invited to, to Istanbul. The atmosphere is very cheerful. The guests are dancing and drinking until the Sultan asks, who among you here is afraid of the other? The German Kaiser says he's fearless and actually wants to conquer the country of the French. And all the kings of the world tremble and basically run home. Um, and here I just have some few stances. Uh, so back in France, Lapoleon or Napoleon consults with his ministers and prepares for war. That's what you see here in the first stances and recruits lots of soldiers from various parts of Portuguese, East Africa, British Central Africa, the Belgian Congo and Madagascar. So the troop is, is already, so to say, very multinational. And he sends a letter to the Kaiser in Hamburg. Um, there are many references to European cities asking for revenge. Then the sea battle, mind you, the sea battle is taking then place in, in Switzerland. And that is fierce. So there are lots of ships which explodes and thousands of people die. The French troops are utterly defeated and the Kaiser celebrates in Hamburg, of course. Um, then the French, of course, I say because they are, port, they are only port cities, interesting enough, they are the European port cities, which are kind of which figure. So Manchester, Bordeaux and Marseille and, um, and Hamburg. The French assemble new tro troops, the Kaiser, Kaiser invades and actually bombards Paris and many, many more people die. Finally, Napoleon has to give up and actually begs the, the British king to come in and actually buy him out and the British king takes over. So now the battles are between the Germans and the British and they mostly take place then in Eastern Africa. Um, so let me see, no. This is later. So, so um, it, it takes place in British Netherlands. We have battlefields all over Tanganyika. We have parts of Mozambique and, and the Belgian Congo. Then there is a last part of the war, which takes place in, as the poem says, the bush, where lots of soldiers fall and actually rather die of hunger, since there is, as the poem says, no food, which reflects very much the, the last, uh, the part of the First World War, 1916 to 1918, where basically the British and the Germans were fighting a guerrilla war and devastating the whole area of northern Mozambique and, and southern, um, southern Tanzania. And actually many more people died of hunger than actually of being killed by bullets. Then you have the German soldiers um, finally try to attack um, Manchester, so back in Europe, but they do not manage to break through the British defense until the Germans sent General Rito, probably referring to the notorious General um, Leto Vorbeck, who um, then, with the help of new machine guns, wipes out whole areas. So that, at the end, the poem says, there was no one on the battlefield. All adults and children have perished. And this is where the poem um, ends rather, rather abruptly. I'm going to, in a minute, talk about the poem again and about the vast kind of landscape. Um, but first of all, I want to give you a bit of an idea of why Swahili, how does this poem sit in northern Mozambique, uh, where Swahili is not a commonly um, um, spoken language, but it's actually a language just reserved 
for um, poetic and religious recitations and actually has to be translated for the audience who doesn't speak Swahili. It's a bit like film dubbing. Yeah? So they, even in performance, they perform in Swahili, but immediately the poem is translated into Ekoti, the local um, the local language and Ekoti and Swahili are quite distant. They People don't easily understand um, each other. So let me talk a bit of what Beecroft would probably call the ecology of, of that of that place and actually also as you might see the trace of another map that is slowly slowly kind of fading out of people's memory so here um the red circle shows you angosh and um angosh um here all along the coast the so-called swahili coast swahili has been a first language to many and a second and a third language to even more people since roughly the first millennium already and in the 15th century as i said angosh was one of the important swahili city states also having lots of connections with all the other city states you see the names here mm, um sorry um being being listed and Ekoti, actually, the language also shows this very early Swahili influence. In the basic vocabulary, there's lots of early Swahili influence. And later, when the Portuguese came and disrupted lots of, lots of, lots of coastal links, um, people in Angosh rather turned towards the mainland. And this is why you have actually nowadays more influence from other Bantu languages on, um, on Ekoti. But that changed again. We're talking about changing maps in the 19th century, because then Swahili gained influence and became a very dominant language all along the coast. This seems to be quite paradoxical in a way, because it's a time when already, so to say, colonialism is kind of, um, yeah, trying to gain a stronghold in a way. The colonizers tries to gain a stronghold. It's a time when the Omani Sultan moves his throne to Zanzibar. So lots of Arabic influence as well. But neither Arabic nor the colonizers' language began to dominate much in communication. But it's actually Swahili more than ever became a very trans-regional language of trade and letter communication all along the coast, but also to Madagascar, to Yemen, um, and to Goa. So the Portuguese administration used Swahili also in trans-oceanic um, uh, communication in its colonial um, letter communication, as well as later than the Germans and as well um, the British, actually. Um, then, as well, <laughs> along the coast, actually, the rise of Swahili as a language of communication is not so much actually due to the, to the trade, but um, very much uh, linked to the growing influence of Sufi brotherhoods in the 19th century and an effort to popularize Islam and Islamic education through poetry mostly. So people use poetry, systematically also translated um, uh, poetry from Arabic or rather adapted, it's not direct translation, ad adapted Arabic um, stories into, into Swahili. And at that time as well, very much um, in written form. And there is one genre, the genre of the Kaiser, the Utensi, which became very much dominant at that time. So here's one example, it's the poem about the prophet's death, the prophet Muhammad, very much a Sufi topic, uh, the prophet as a martyr you can identify with. Um, and here you see, well, I just collected some manuscript samples for you to see. So this is Swahili and Arabic script from starting mostly, it started um, most probably what we know from the historical sources in Northern Kenya. So the Lamu archipelago and then the manuscripts I mean, parallel to the Sufi movement in a way, moved southwards and also arrived then in Angosh. Yeah, so the texts in a way um, really, in a, well, echo um, the growing religious kind of influence and networks of the Sufi brotherhoods at that time. So from Lamo in the north of Kenya, through Zanzibar, which becomes the most important hub of the Indian Ocean in the 19th century, and then via the Comoros, actually, which play quite a prominent role, then to Angosh and um, the Ilia de Mozambique, and partly also um, via Madagascar. So it's um, the texts which reflect um, this kind of spread, but which also, of course, provides people with, a, with narratives um, to kind of share this idea of belonging to a common um, Muslim community again, a coastal, a coastal community. The colonizers did not change much, actually, um, in this world, because, as I said already, they rather profited from Swahili and Arabic script in letter communication. Um, the Portuguese, 
um, did not even try to adapt the script. The Germans um, um, switched to Latin script rather late, so beginning of the 20th century, and the British also, so to say, partly adopted the model of also allowing other um, Arabic script and, and Swahili and Arabic script in the lower in the lower administration and also employing actually the same elite of well-educated um, Swahili scholars versed in Arabic and actually able also to read and write um, Swahili in Arabic script. Yeah, So it's not, uh, so to say, the col colonial world didn't mean so much of a, of a disruption here. Here, this is the context where exactly these new poetry, however, also emerged. So it's a poetry that all of a sudden did not talk about the prophet anymore, or not only, but also I've referred to it before already either praising then the colonizer or also being very critical actually um, towards, um, towards the colonizer. Yeah? So it's, it's so to say a new kind of historiography uh, which, which emerged at um, at that time, and which reflects, as the poem on the left, um, the poem about the Germans conquering the Mrima coast, reflects very much the military raids, the, um, the confrontations in war, and the insurgencies which happened in the, in, in the end of the ninth, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, and the First World War included, as we'll see um, then, then with the Kaiser. Yeah, so one can, can read, so to say, the, the Kaiser is very much part of this trend of actually moving away from our kind of imagining a new kind of map. Uh, so not Arabia and the Prophet Muhammad, but now, so to say, the contemporary wars, the contemporary battles and confrontations um, of the time. Yeah. And um, now I actually want to move to another yeah, now I want to reflect upon what I said at the beginning. How does the Kaiser, the poem, narrate the world? Yeah, what does it actually, how is the world in the Kaiser itself narrated? How does it think about the world? How does it imagine the world? Um, in, in, in his, and, and this is very much what I propose as well at the end. So starting also looking really also at how texts imagine world and how they project um, worlds. So in his reflection on literary worlds, I already referred to him, Eric Hyatt underlines that aesthetic worlds are among other things, always a relation to and a theory of the lived world. The Kaiser does not leave any doubt that it considers itself essentially as a narrative of the world and of the world war, but really very much of the world. So Dunia, this is the, the Swahili word, um, a well-established loan word from Arabic, recurs with an unusual frequency um, throughout the poem. And I just wanted to give you, this is not the best dic dictionary definition, but I just wanted to give you one. Um, it has a, a variety of different of different meanings, and we could basically very much extend what is here in a very common um, Swahili English dictionary. Uh, but it helps me to kind of think through some of the concepts of world ideas of the world that that recur in the Kaiser. And the first one, which you find here in the dictionary um, definition, the sample sentence is: "The world is big." And this implies actually a vast spatial dimension that is very much important for the Kaiser. So differently from universe, because there often the Bantu term ulimwengu is actually used, um, which, which puts the emphasis on a layered kind of cosmos, uh, Dunia often refers to, to the vast global extent, or, or if you want the picture image of the world, like expressed, um, expressed in maps. And the Kaiser uses a lot to form actually Duniani in the world, which again um, even highlights more the idea that it's the geographically broad world that is actually at stake. Um, also the narrator announces that uh, right at the beginning he says he narrates, he wants to narrate the world at large in a really grand narrative of enormous scope. And this is what the Utenzi um, is actually a perfect fit for because the Utenzi, the genre, is not merely long, that the poem is not merely long because the war <laughs> took so long, but length is actually also prescribed feature of the genre. So by definition, an utensi can never be pithy or short, but presents always, as Sharif um, defined it, a long explanation of historical importance. And also, I think I'm, you already got this impression 
um, the war, of course, um, that is described in the poem is not restricted to Europe, uh, but there are soldiers and um, that are being recruited from all parts of Portuguese East Africa, British Central Africa, the Belgian Congo, uh, Madagascar. So I just sort of say put some dots here on the map to show the place names because they are legion as where people come from or where battles, I mean, the soldiers come from in the poem or where battles were, were being fought. And this is, as you see, very, uh, if you want, across empires and across um, um, the borders. Yeah. The, the panorama as well, I think, as you probably heard from my short summary, also constantly shifts and the battlefields also ro rotate over a huge geographical plane. So between Europe and East Africa, and there is also the idea of depicting a world very much in, in connection. Hmm? There are constantly telegrams being sent, um, letters being sent, or people, I mean, messengers being sent to either Hamburg or Marseille. So there is a constant kind of... Um, idea of connection that is being underlined and hence would could probably say that the Kaiser actually presents a globalized and a quite modern world defined by connections and um, what Giddens in a rather classical definition of globalization called the intensification of worldwide social relations which link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many, while, many miles away and vice versa. I think this is very much what the Kaiser um, is actually about. As well, I could say much more, but I think I'm, I'm not going to go into details here. The global connections are also very much narrated in the form of what Hyatt actually called an ample narrative. So um, he expands on Auerbach's notion of um, literary world by looking at the realism. Well, Auerbach looks at the realism in the Old Testament and, and in Homer, and um, Hayat actually adds a category by um, talking about narratives which only foreground and hardly ever background any occurrences or any parts of the narration. And this is very much what the Kaiser does. Everything needs to be narrated. And particularly, the poem is very much interested in narrating what happened simultaneously in different parts of the world. So while the Kaiser in Hamburg takes a decision, uh, Napoleon in, in France is desperate and there are soldiers being recruited in, in East Africa. And this comes with some narrative techniques um, that, that I, can, I can comment much more on that um, as well in the discussion, but it means very much, so to say, jumping very much between these different parts um, of the world, which again creates this impression of the vast world and things happening at the same time in different places. Secondly, and uh, I could say much more about, so to say, different notions of the world, I just want to highlight another one, and this is an idea of a narrative totality. So nothing less than the world at large, the course of history or the life, as the dictionary definition also gives us um, a meaning of, um, of Dunia. One could also say age of men, that is actually at stake in the poem. Yeah? So it's very much concerned with the total, and it's the total of history or the totality of, his, of history that is being narrated. So the Kaiser does not narrate a narrative of the World War, but in fact, the narrative of, of World War I. And accordingly, on the one hand, um, we find, so to say, quite some realist parts. Yeah? For instance, when the, Bush, when, the, when the guerrilla war that takes part very much or took part very much in what the poem calls the Bush, yeah, there, has lot, there are lots of realist elements of hunger, of um, devastation, of um, this kind of tip and run guerrilla war being fought at that time. But on the other hand, uh, well, you saw probably already sea battles in Switzerland and Napoleon being involved, of course, goes beyond a realist depiction of, um, of the war at, um, at that time. So it also that the poem also exceeds so the fuzziness, but also the mediocrity of, of realism and stages the French German confrontation, of course, to a maximum extent by actually, well, taking Napoleon, so the prototypical um, conqueror or emperor here, and not just anyone. Yeah? And while the part, for instance, the siege of Paris, this reminds rather probably um, a Franco-Prussian war of the 1870s, one could probably say what has also been said about other Utenzi, that the Kaiser actually telescopes a number of historical events into one to achieve really a fullness of, of effect, a total 
um, a total narrative. Another aspect of it is, I just gave here two um, examples. I could give many more. There are the heroes of the world fighting and the imam of the world, the sultan of the world, calling them um, to, to his banquet at the beginning of the poem. So it is the showdown, if you want, of um, all the important people ever. And um, as well, so to say, there are these seemingly endless ships and troops, um, like the classical epic catalog that, that also really conveys an idea of this is an exhaustive all. There is nobody who has been um, left out in this, in this narrative. Another part of it is um, Dunia, the world, which is not covered by the, by the dictionary definition, also figures very much as a place of wonders. This is already in the old poems, in the, in the, well, in the Sufi, in the, so to say, religious poetry. So there we have jinns and many-headed monsters and angels. And here they become very much replaced by airplanes and torpedoes and machine guns. And um, the biggest protagonist is, um, however, the warship, the Manuari, uh, which, so to say, is described quite at length and, and recurs again and again, uh, in a sense reflecting a light motive also of imperial imaginary of superiority. They were really the wonders of technology at, at that time, as you also see. I just, so to say, um, took this picture again from the German uh, East African newspaper, Kiongozi, which describes a sea ship quite at length, but this is just one example. The sea ship is all over. The battleship is found in travelogues in lots of different um, descriptions um, of, the, I mean, of the time. And you really find the poet full of all kind of um, admiring uh, what in the text figures as Dunia Manuari, so literally world ship, and it's quite an elliptical kind of kind of construction, so one can read it very much in very different ways. So it's the world of ships or a world of ships or also probably the world as a ship. So the sudden, the almost miraculous appearance of ships often described like a thunderstorm, their deadly assaults, the dramatic sinking, uh, these are just, they are a wonder, and if not a metaphor of the world, then as such of this kind of very miraculous and wonderful um, world. Yeah. Then a last part, so to say what I find really striking about the Kaiser is that the text as such offers quite a reflection about um, what it means to narrate the world. So that narrating the world becomes a subject of the text itself. Uh, in, in, in a kind of a frame, a framing kind of dialogue at the beginning, this is quite typical as well for the genre. So there is always a narrator, a constructed narrator. And here the narrator at the beginning talks to his wife and says, I want to write this poem, but in fact, I'm quite worried or I don't know really how to do it. Yeah? So he says at the beginning, worries have troubled me. And the wife reacts and, and, he, and he tells her, I want to write about World War I, but I'm not sure if I will be able to do so. And again, this is quite a common um, kind of um, thing actually recurring in, in, in this kind of genre. So it's not only here, but it takes quite a particular form here. And the wife says, yeah, in fact, how can you or how could you possibly narrate about overseas and the world at large? And he wants to talk about the world at large when you have never been there. So the wife actually expresses her doubts about the capacity of the husband to, na to narrate um, the world, and this is very much um, a question, if you want um, a kind of question how to narrate the world, but also an empirical question. So how can one talk about the world or narrate the world if one has only a limited perceptual kind of reach and experience, one has not experienced the whole world? And as well, it becomes also, of course, a textual question. So how do you organize your narrative then? Um, the wife's question actually seems to foreground the, the, the lack of experience, the lack of lived experience. So how can her husband talk about what he hasn't seen? So the husband then says, the narrator says, okay, um, we need, I need inspiration. So let's pray. We will pray to God and his beloved um, prophet yeah, to kind of give him the capacity uh, to, to narrate the world. The wife also adds her blessings to the whole thing, and then the narrator is relieved. So at the end, he says, on that day, you should know, he's talking to his wife, I had joy in my heart. It is better to narrate the world, but also translate, I, I can narrate the world rather than not to narrate, to narrate the world. Yeah? So it's possible to narrate the world after all. And... Um, 
here, so to say, in what he says at the end, it is better to narrate the world. There is literally the, the words of the world. One has to find the right words of the world. The world becomes primarily then a question of how to put it into words, how to talk, how to talk about it. Afterwards, he asks his wife uh, for a pen and a paper. This is, again, quite formulaic. It occurs in many of these um, poems of the time. But again, it seems to foreground the idea that, uh, like, a, like a performative metafictional kind of act, that um, history has to be written. The world is not just there, and the history of it is also not just there. Um, we can only know the world, in a sense, through the narrative. So we have to write it down. It seems almost like a very post-structuralist kind of reflection of what history, um, of what hi of what history is. The Kaiser, as such, seems to to, cons to highlight very much the constructed nature of the world, and which needs to be written, which needs to be composed, and then which needs to be performed. And in that sense, I, I, I think the Kaiser can actually offer us an idea of text, if not a theory of text, that I find quite productive for discussions of world literature. So the, the, the relationship between literature and the world is not a given, but probably should become a primary question in debates of world literature. Uh, so putting an emphasis on narrated worlds in relation to local genres and prevailing concepts and, and notions of literature uh, means going beyond reading literature to confirm already preconceived pre -conceived historical, political, or geography, geographical realities. Uh, so that literature always seems to come like last or secondary to already um, primarily constructed world. Now I want to um, conclude very briefly. So the Kaiser seems to be a very odd specimen of world literature. It, it has not been consecrated by the World Republic of Letters or by the book market. It also does not travel, so neither to the West nor elsewhere, or to refer to Damrosch's notion of world literature as a literature in translation. It gains in translation into, into a koti, but not a broader reach, but a more local one. So the translation actually even makes it more localized. It also does not really speak back to power, or at least not just in one way. I can, talk, I can comment more on that um, as well in the discussion. And it also does not emit an air of cosmopolitanism easily that transcends the nation. Um, the latter is not much of a concern to it because Angosh sits very much at the edge of the nation and the Swahili world, as well as, as I said already, several empires. So it does not easily fit into the dichotomies of the cosmopolitan versus the provincial, uh, which Hector Oyos in his article World Literature's Other Other <laughs> describes as the diehard dichotomy of a wider outlook versus a smaller perspective defined by navel gazing and glorified local color. The Kaiser actually speaks quite against the narrowness of the local, necessarily concerned with small worlds of small communities and typically also expressed in vernacular in opposition to the globalized world, which is the habitat then of the cosmopolitan. So narrating the first world war, the poem, the poem projects quite a broad vision of the world with regard, with regard to time and space and imagining a huge topography actually, and also a world very much um, that is very much entangled. The poem um, creates an, imagine, an imagination of the modern world. And after all, we are talking about World War I, which is a crucial event of Western modernity, but, and also makes the West quite an important setting. Um, but, and this is very central to my concern, the West is not the only center of the poem's narrative. In fact, one can actually question whether it is a center at all. And um, the poem can also not, not be read as actually adopting Western narratives. Rather, it largely makes use of, and this is what I wanted to show, um, makes use of very local and transregional literary and conceptual tools, writing, first war, writing the first world war into a Swahili genre, the Utenzi, so in which large worlds had been narrated already um, for at least two centuries before. Uh, the transregional genre also cuts across col colonies and empires. So worldliness did not come to East Africa with the West. The Utenzi became a traveling template for the production of history from the early Muslim battles now to the colonial inv invasion. 
and the Kaiser is just is just part of it. So in short, it doesn't really need the novel to narrate a modern world. The poem also adds in question aids in questioning the dichotomy of traditional, modern, local, and global, and the idea that this globalized world can only be narrated and adopted um, genres uh, from the West. So the, the utensi here is very much linked to a different genre. Um, or a notion of, of literature and mediality. So here we have handwritten manuscripts in Arabic script and oral recitation rather than print, but it also doesn't preclude the topics of modernity. So we have lots of technology and, and media. So I mentioned already the torpedoes, the, um, the battleships, um, the airplanes, they're actually, it, it, it's a whole inventory of the modern world that we find in here. It depicts 20th century East African experiences in engagement with the world. And from such a perspective, what the world is and how it changes and how it is narrated becomes, first of all, a question and not a given category. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa, for, for that amazing talk and really, really thought provoking, stimulating. I have so many questions and thoughts to, to, to throw you. But I, I just want to kind of open up the discussion uh, to everyone else first. And I can see there's a hand up already. So um, I'm going to go straight to, to Galin, who has his hand up. Galin. Thank you, uh, Joe. And, and thank you, Clarissa. It's very good to see you again. Hi. Uh, a really wonderful paper. And I have two small questions, and they're both prompted by my total lack of familiarity with this text. Um, the first one is, um, when the narrator responds that it is better to uh, narrate the world than not to, does the narrator give any specific reasons in the text why this is the case? And, and the other question is um, to do with this um, dual meaning of uh, this word, dunya, um, world, but also life. Mm -hmm. um, does this duality appear in the text? Is it actively used in, in the text? And does the text, because you, you gave us these references to Marseille and to Hamburg, uh, does the text actually also talk about how this war was experienced on the ground on the um, um, coast of East Africa in this local community and in the household of this narrator? Does he reference his own life or the life of, of, of his um, family? Well, thank you. Um... Why to narrate? Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. It, it is very much um, a topos that, that recurs in this, in this genre, that there is often the fear expressed uh, in a formulaic way by the poet that he, or sometimes also she, is not able because there are so many different narrative threats and he or she is kind of um, fears that um, one loses kind of uh, the overview of the whole thing when one kind of gets lost in too many things. So it's never easy in a sense to, to write such a poem. Yeah? And, and often there is another conventional thing often happening at the end of this poetry where people apologize and they say, if, I'm, if I introduce any mistakes, if I haven't explained something properly, please excuse me and help me. So come in and, and kind of fill the gaps or, um, and, and this is very, very formulaic on the one hand. Here, I feel like it's, um, <laughs> why to narrate? I think you feel very much the urge that this is the narrator who is so excited. So he wants to narrate this thing but feels very insecure, or this is, of course, it's, it's a very much a staged insecurity as well. You know? and, um, and then it's the inspiration, it's kind of, so to say, the prayer very often that also here calms him down the narrative, feeling like, okay, now I have the support of God, which is also very much an inspirational support. So now I feel I'm, I'm not going to get lost immediately. You know? So I, I can risk to narrate the world. And, um, and it's, it's a risk, however, to, in a sense, um, trying to, uh, which is also very interesting if you think about it. Um, 
then about the world and um and life yeah this is something i i had to cut a bit short because this is quite interesting how how dunya is also is also life because in the poem it it figures very much in the in, in the concrete meaning of life so there are people who lose dunya and that means they the soldiers who fell who died in the war so these are the expressions also being that are also being used in the poem but it has much more more than an individual idea of life i think it's very much what um, i think etherton and simpler when they think about what world actually means referring to germanic languages and they the world or the world meaning the age of men <laughs> It's also that it's not the individual life only, but the 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 life, um, the, the history as a total in opposition, so to say, or as part of um, um, of a divine, so to say, wider history. So in the in the Sufi poetry that precedes this one, you often have this. The, it's always this pair of akhira, so the hereafter, and this world, and this world is always um, dunya, whereas the akhira is is the hereafter, is paradise or hell. And in this sense, it also has this idea of um, it's, it has an it, it somehow somehow also has an eschatological implication. So it's a world that comes to an end at one point, and this is something that is also somehow plays a role in this poem because it is, as I said already, it's the narrative of the world, and it's the it's the war of the pagans. So you feel also it's like more like a like a, like the, like an end time war that is being fought here which is another dimension to the narrative. So it's very much between realist depiction, hy hyperbolic depictions, and really this idea that this is the end, that, that you somehow feel not, it's not so strong, but it comes in. Um, and, um, and, and then, so to say, if it comes to the realist depictions, I find that quite striking because the Utenzi as such is normally doesn't try to be realist at all. So it doesn't want to go into, real life experiences, lived experiences. But here we have a depiction of hunger. Also, there is a part where women are being raped, uh, where huts were burned down, which is very much for me, um, well, I read quite a bit about the First World War in that zone, is very much a reflection of the increasing violence and the increasing, the, the, the kind of more and more guerrilla tactics also, first the Germans and later than the British actually adopted in this terrible, in this terrible war. And he doesn't, the narrator doesn't talk about his household, but still one has the idea here, it's, we are having almost like a documentation of, um, not with a lot of empathy, yeah? so not feeling with the victims, but just like as if somebody was reporting what, what happened there. And this is this, you know, this is that it's different kind of layers of the narrative, the all time heroes fighting, but then you have this realist parts where, um, one feels what one is getting really close to an experience there. Quite unusual for for that context, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Galin. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, I I had a question in the chat, and then I can see Charles. You have your hand up. Do you, do you mind if I, I'll go to the question in the chat first? Is that is that coming first, and then we'll go to Charles. Uh, so this is a, a question from Francesca, who has unstable unstable connection, so so won't speak. But I'll, I'll read it out. Um, so a couple of questions actually. Does this utensi uh, incorporate other forms of narration description in the same way as it incorporates the warship, um, like for example newspapers or the radio? Um, I.e., does it show awareness of other genres, or does it claim the whole space, uh, so to say? And the second question, why is it still narrated today um, if it's about a particular uh, and distant historical event? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, uh, there, there's lots of reference to other modern technology, yeah, um, which I find quite, uh, quite striking as well and quite in detail actually, because if, you, uh, well, as I said already, I read quite a bit about um, first the First World War in that area and it's very much about weapon technology and different types of machine guns. And this is what is actually also being reflected in the poem. I, at the beginning, didn't understand why there are so many different guns, which for me are all the same. And actually also to people now, they seem to be more or less the same. Um, 
And here I feel, so this is, um, I can't answer your question fully. I wish I could. I, I feel that there, these newspapers um, with their constant uh, documentation about new technology, because they were obsessed actually with um, teaching people about the railway, about the Zeppelin, about, uh, about the warships, so to say. I, I feel this is this kind of, uh, what is that? The celebration of modern technology is somehow something that the Utenzi here also, there is an influence from this kind of new genre. And I, I see it really at that time, mostly in the newspaper, um, where the Germans, they, they kind of, the, the Kiongosi, the newspaper, which I also had in the PowerPoint is a newspaper the Germans started, but there are also earlier British ones. And there are quite a number of these um, newspapers coming into being. And the biggest thing they do, and, and then the, the, the thing is that happens at the beginning of the 20th century. So all of a sudden there are pictures in there as well, which is quite new because it's the first genre, uh, the, the first way people can kind of see warships before they arrive. Yeah? I mean, if they don't have them right in front of them, this is something they can see, but they also see other technology like, um, like the railway even before it actually arrives in Eastern Africa. And I feel this kind of, I think on the German side, it is an obsession. I think I, can, I think I can really call it an obsession with this modern technology is something that is very much also part in, in the poem. Um, it's difficult to prove the link, but I, I just see, so to say, these connections. Um, and um, the, second, the second question, why this is still being recited? Yeah, this is another, I think, um, a very interesting um, question. Um, on the one hand, um, there is, I think I have two answers. On the one hand, Northern Mozambique is a place that particularly because of Mozambique's civil war, so the war after independence, Mozambique became independent in 75 and then it had a terrible war. Uh, first of all, um, I mean, fighting for independence and then actually turning into a civil war until the 1990s. So it's really more or less 30 years of war, which isolated Mozambique completely and particularly the northern parts. So, and there, so you have some techniques which in a sense survived there because people were really cut off uh, from lots of other parts of, um, of the world, yeah? So you, this is, so to say, a very lame answer. So in a sense, lack of um, other means of entertainment, they kept on, or they could preserve this, but I don't think it's a very good answer. I think the second one is for me, which I find very interesting is, I feel that people also reflected about their own war experience of the 1980s in particular, by reciting the poem, because also the book, I had it in one of, of the slides, which Fundi Haliti um, is holding on his lap, actually. There are lots of, so to say, that the book as such is a very interesting material object because there were lots of, um, you know, on, on the page you have the margins and then on the margins, people would scribble, long live Renamo. So one of the war, so to say, um, parties, so one, the guerrilla side, so to say. And then a few pages later, long live Relimo. So the other, so to say, the, the government um, um, kind of army. And you see also the kind of, so to say, changing contemporary history of the 20th century of Angosh in the book being reflected. And I felt like people were also interested in these war stories because of all the atrocities, Angosh became a very embattled zone again in the 1980s, yeah? in, a, in a really very different, on the one hand, a very different war, but on the other hand, also a very cruel, a very, very violent war, um, particularly using guerrilla techniques and attacking the civilians. Yeah? So I feel like they, I mean, performing this poem made also probably sense to them at that, um, at that time. And this is also why um, it, it survived for such a long time. And there's also really this fascination of, um, of Swahili, yeah? as if, so to say, we all decided, okay, none of us is a French speaker or very few of us are French speakers, but we, we adore, we admire French because it kind of reminds us of an older period and we keep on, in a sense, reciting this. I think this is also, I mean, Beecroft talks about how some of these ecologies, how traces can live on for much longer than actually the actual practice of using a language is actually in, in place, what I, what I find quite, quite fascinating as well.
Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Clarissa. Thanks, Francesca, for your, your questions. Uh, Charles. Great. Thank you very much, Clarissa. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I, I, just following on from the first question by uh, Galen, I was really interested in the fact that uh, dunya is an Arabic loan word. And I was wondering if there are uh, indigenous terms in other Bantu languages or indeed in Swahili itself um, that could be roughly translated as world. And whether, obviously, it's much more complicated than this, but whether it's the case of an Arabic loanword that has incorporated elements of Bantu philosophy, or rather um, the incorporation of a Semitic concept, rather than just the word itself, into Swahili. Thank you. Yes, there is a, I mean, well, thank you. Um, that's a very interesting question, because actually, um, there, there is a Bantu word, so ulimwengu, which is quite common in in many Bantu languages. So it's a, it's one root yeah, that you find then in, in the different languages, um, which, however, now in Swahili is ulimwengu is much more used to refer to the universe or to the cosmos in a, with a, the idea of a layered cosmos. Or and now, if you want, if if people refer, well, I mean, there are also some now. I, th I think we could find also cases where now somebody could say, no, in fact, quite there is also used in a different way. But dun dunia is often used in the sense of, as I said, it's, it's like the map image of the world, uh, the extended geography of the world, that's dunia. There you would not easily say this is ulimwengo. Ulimwengo is more like really the cosmos or um, like the existential, you know, that the world exists and, in a, and also with reference to Islamic cosmology, uh, I mean, the, the, the um, Swahili coast, um, well, Islam arrived around the, um, well, before the first millennium. So it has a long history of uh, actually Islamization. So the cosmos is, of course, also a layered one. Yeah? So there you have all the, there you have dunia in all the texts really also refers to the cosmos. But nowadays, so to say, and also the way the poem uses it, it's much more that, that a kind of extended the world, yeah, the world map, as 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 one one could probably say, but but still, sometimes you know, even in Arabic, so to say, the idea of of the cosmos, and as well as I said before in in my answer to um, um, to Galen, it's also the world in the sense of it's the here and now, yeah, um, in opposition, so to say, to the hereafter, which has both an eschatological implication, so it's going to come to an end, there is going to be judgment day, we are all going to die, but it also has a moral implication, which means it's, it this plays a very important role in the Sufi poetry, it's treacherous, it tells you something which is not quite is, so don't rely on it. There is this whole Sufi, I mean, this whole body of Sufi poetry. Don't rely on dunia. It will kind of tell you, oh, it's beautiful. There are so many pleasures of the world, but in fact, we are all going to die. Yeah? So, so this, these are the different kind of um, um, connotations um, it can have. And they are... I mean, I think there are as, should I say, contradictory or, or kind of overlapping as there are in, I think, the languages you mentioned, yeah? where even if one thinks about um, the English world, um, it, it can also have lots of these connotations as well, from moral eschatological to the world image. Yeah? Um, the, the image of one could probably think about what it is compared to the earth. Yeah? There, it would become very tricky as well in, 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 in Swahili. But, but in the poem, I think I'm, in, in the poem, one can really say it's this geographical idea of, the, of, of dunia, which I find very interesting. It really does partly away with the Sufi idea, partly. Great, thank you. Thanks, Clarissa. That is fascinating because I, I'm also thinking about the, the comparison with Arabic and another opposition there would be alam, so this notion of uh, world in relation to the nation, the nation state. And I, I was wondering, I mean, I was just wondering about that and, and dunya, I mean, thinking about, uh, I was reading Michael Allen's book uh, on world literature and he, he introduces alam and dunya alongside each other and he thinks of dunya as um, the, precisely the earthly, the mundane, the everyday, 
uh, the temporal, um, perhaps in opposition to the geographical. So it's interesting some of those contradictions uh, that that you see even within the same the same term or loan word. Sorry, I'm 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 just um, uh, I'm conscious two other hands are up. So uh, Karen, you had your hand up first. Well, Clarissa, that was such a beautiful paper and so thought-provoking. Thanks so much. I have a very simple question. I was intrigued about the comment you made at the beginning that uh, the the performance is translated, is kind of dubbed into Ekoti as it's being performed. Is this simultaneous? Is it afterwards? Is it the the performer himself or herself who translates it, or is there a specialized mm -hmm. translator to hand? That's one part. The other part is, is this the only place where the utenzi gets translated? Is it really, really localized? Or are there other places where it might be being translated into other localized languages? Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, thanks for um, this very interesting question. Um, the translation, I think one should probably say interpretation is this kind of ad hoc um, uh, kind of translation um, happens after every stanza. So, and ideally, although when, when we saw the poem being performed, there were just two performers. So they, they, they are adopting, it's even more complicated in a sense. I'm, I was simplifying things because they are using a Makua. Makua is the big Bantu language in the area. Ekoti is small, Makua is much bigger. And uh, they're using a Makua style of performance. So that means you have two performers normally. One starts singing, and the second one, or chanting rather, and the second one kind of comes in. It almost sounds like an echo. If my connection was not so bad um, here today and not so unreliable, <laughs> I've probably been able to show you. And then there's a third person, ideally, although we didn't see that, there's a third person who after every stanza translates, but uses a normal speech mode. So not chanting, but, but translating. And sometimes seeing that everybody falls asleep in the audience, also adds a joke or explains something. You know, not, not everybody understands, um, well, battleships, well, now you see them because of the Somali pirates again and Al-Shabaab, but I mean, not everybody has seen a warship, for instance. So somebody explains something. And this is very um, uh, flexible as well. So um, I, I, there, I, I've once given another um, presentation where I showed how then the text changes as well in this process of, <laughs> of translation. Um, and so in the area, this is, um, there are a number of languages uh, where the, the Swahili poetry becomes translated into. So Enahara is another Makua variety on the Ilia de Mozambique. So there as well, they, they translate. So this is just Mozambique. But in, in, in Tanzania, I've seen um, Haya. So this is a big Bantu language around the lakes, um, uh, Lake Victoria mostly where also you have, I mean, in, in Hainhaya, there is already a huge epic tradition as well. And then they adopted partly, so to say, Swahili and also translated the Utenzi again into some higher, um, newly adopted prosody, I should say. So not, not into a higher genre that already existed, but kind of trying to get closer to the Swahili one. And I think there might be other cases of this um, as well. The Utenzi is very much a genre that is alive. So in Tanzania, you have it now. I mean, they, we just, they just celebrated 60 years of independence. So there are Tenzi all over and, um, and in Kenya as well. So it's, it's very much something that, that um, is constantly, where people constantly compose. Hmm. Brilliant. Th thanks, Clarissa. Thanks, Karen, for your, for your question. Um, and then Alina. Mm -hmm have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Clarissa. This was a great paper. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would like you to elaborate a little bit on the connection between world literature and the poem. So, I mean, I sort of wonder what you are trying to do. Are you trying to construct a world literature from within the Swahili world? Or how is the imagination of the world in the poem 
related to this whole discussion on world literature. Mm -hmm. Because in your conclusion, you said basically that the poem does not really uh, sort of speak back to the various concepts of world literature. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on where you are getting at with mm -hmm. this connection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm, well, one thing is, well, first of all, I guess one, one would need to ask what is world literature? And there are, I guess, at least 100 answers to that <laughs> in academia, but particularly outside of it. I think, um, well, Galen worked a lot, again, on this very non-academic roots of the discussion of world literature, right? So the canonic idea, for instance, but, um, and I don't think I'm trying to answer, I, I don't think it's so important to, um, to, to understand or to kind of settle on one definition, right, of, of what that is. I'm just trying to show that there is in a sense, no matter, so to say, which concept um, has been used in this kind of um, recent this, um, debates, yeah? if you look at world literature is a literature and translation that travels beyond its origin, or if you, the world republic of letters, or I mean, what have you, <laughs> all the different kind, or the cosmopolitan, or is it about intertextual references? Yeah, I mean, um, you name it in a way. Um, however, so to say, what, what is quite striking is that still there, there, there are these blind spots of actually a very locally rooted literature and every literature is locally rooted. So I'm not saying this is about the African literature only that if you study it, so to say, and, and, and in a sense, probably it's also the question, what is the other? So we have the concept of world literature by implication, so to say, it always evokes the idea that there must be something that is not, that is a non-world literature or that is a, um, as, as Hoyo said, a provincial literature then probably, yeah. And, or uh, he calls it actually a parochial, <laughs> from the parochy, yeah? um, uh, um, literature. Yeah? And so, and I, so, and, and my intention or my, my kind of concern is more that in all these discussions, there is lots of this literature that I have been working on, that you have probably been working on, other people have been working on, that somehow doesn't fit or doesn't quite fit and still adds very interesting perspective. Sorry on world and probably, and this is not just me, I mean, there have been different kind of um, attempts to really rather start, I think, well, Joseph, you just mentioned it as well, right? To look at different ideas of, of world and worldliness and um, how, so to say, that helps to kind of really also question and kind of really have a productive comparative discussion. Yeah, because one can throw these questions back then at other literatures and wonder how that works and how it works differently. And, um, and on the other hand, uh, so, so this is, so to say, here an approach I'm taking here, but one could also, I think this has also been very much done. I mean, Francesca is a, is a good example. Her research is a good example. Or uh, Mosawi's research on, on the Islamic Republic of Letters, just to look at other, so to say, spheres of circulation. That's what I'm also doing in other parts of the, of the book. So it's not just one thing I'm... Um, um, I'm, I'm kind of trying, um, trying to look at, but here I really found the... Um, almost a paradox quite interesting to think about what what is it so to say to think the world from a apparently small place yeah? and a literature that doesn't easily fit into these categories of of traveling and that kind of, however in a sense kind of um, if we take this very located kind of approach um, yeah raises very interesting questions Thank Sorry, Elena, I didn't know if you wanted to come back or not. <laughs> I mean, thank you. I mean, Clarissa, I know Dunia is also my current obsession, so I, I find I, I found your paper really very interesting. Um, I just wanted maybe I can comment a little bit on what uh, Charles asked about. Um, so there are also concepts of the world in other Bantu languages, like Mokili in Lingala, or Umflaba in Debele. And um, it's really interesting the question that you asked. I mean, there can of course be an imposition of sorts of some kind of Christian or broader concept of the world. But uh, um, I find the Debele or Zimbabwean case particularly interesting because there you have a kind of shift of worlds between pre-colonial to colonial to post-colonial. And there is always a war in between. So there is always a kind of war called 
uh, Chimurenga, Umbugela in, in Debele, or Shona and respectively in Debele, that sort of separates the two worlds. Um, so, and the, the world Umhlaba, for instance, is used by writers to actually speak of this kind of shifting of worlds. Uh, so in a way, it would be the kind of global perspective on uh, everything that is around, the kind of constellation of things. But it's just a kind of comment on the margin. <laughs> Thanks, Alina. I've got I've got one question from Francesca in chat, but perhaps we'll go to Meg first, and then we could take perhaps Francesca's question as a as a closing question because it's it's a big question. <laughs> Meg, thank you, um, thank you so much, Clarissa, for this beautiful paper, thought provoking um, paper. This actually follows a bit on what you were just discussing because what's sticking with me is this notion of. Dunia Manuari and thinking about the, the worship world or the world um, that is a worship. And it occurs to me to ask how much there's a sense, I mean, you've talked about how this is a community um, that of course is already transcultural um, in relation with, uh, with um, other continents for centuries before. So is there a, a sense of break or a, a sense of change that this is a new kind of world, that there was the world <laughs> that already existed, but in this, um, in this moment specifically of, of, the, of the Manuari, of the warship, of the world war, that we have a, a, a rupture of some kind, um, that we've birthed a new, a new version of Dunia. Well, thanks, Meg. Um, yeah, I think it reminds me very much um, of what just Al Alina said about very interesting that the Chimorenga is in a sense always the, the end and the beginning of a new world. Um, it seems so in the poem, I mean, the, the, the kind of weight the narrative has, you know, I mean, or that the Sultan of the world yeah, calls the kings of the world to a summit at the beginning is almost like, um, th yeah, there is an era coming to an end or, or, um, or a new era in a sense um, starting and as well kind of the massiveness in, in this, you really feel like there's everything at stake. So the world is coming <laughs> probably really to an end here. And um, yeah, I feel like probably this is what I, what I was trying to, to say with reference to the warships that yeah, here the, the warship can probably really stand for this very dramatic, uh, yeah, really world shifting event of, of World War I where all of the sudden, yeah, I mean, the, the world, the, the, also the way the, the warships normally appear, they appear like a thunderstorm. You can see them from miles, so to say, away, and then they are huge, they are massive. And then they sink, they explode. So there is, so to say, they, they, they become protagonists. And as well, there's another dimension to it because as in lots of other poetry as well, you know so well as well, the, the world is often also compared to the ocean. Yeah? Uh, this idea that the ocean and the world are both very tricky. So you just see the surface, you don't know what it is, been, what, what you find actually beneath. And um, which is a very, very common kind of metaphor in, in lots of this um, Sufi poetry as well. So it's, it is also the ocean, I think one, one could say much more about, um, um, about that as well. I think this is also why, not only because in, in World War I, I mean, in East Africa, the warships also played a role. It's not that they were unimportant, but definitely, so to say, looking at what then happened in this extended guerrilla war, so to say, on the mainland, this was rather insignificant yeah but but they made a huge impression as well yeah i think there is more to say i i think i find them quite i i've always found them very prominent not only in this poem this the warships actually thank yeah. thanks so much uh meg for your question um clarissa I, I know we, we're coming up to, to half past where, where we have to end. So I wanted really to just, that there's a, a question in the chat from Francesca, which kind of is a nice closing question. It's, it's perhaps a, a, 
a challenger. It's a big question, so I'll, I'll ask you. It's about how you. Justify... Can you can you hear me at all, or no, um, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, right? Yeah. Let me no because I don't have a good. But uh, just to explain to the others, you know, this is a very real question. You know, I would very much like uh, Clarissa's book to be part of the CUP series on studies on world literature, and we have a CUP editor who says, "How is this world literature?" You know, he doesn't recognize any. Of the text, any of the of the you know genres. Uh, this is you know regional. This is something else. This is you know. So I mean, I think we've heard you know how you know how generative and how rich and how you know deep and wide ranging and all that this you know approach you know thinking through of world literature from this perspective is. But how do we sell it? Is my you know is my question. Should I answer that? <laughs> um, well, I think um, I think it's probably exactly. I think what Alena now now said: uh, world literature as a literature that that writes the world and thinks the world from one place is, I think, very much so to say a concern. I think what what also I guess is high time. I think it's really to think beyond these boxes of empires and nation states. So also really only thinking about um, yeah the British Empire. I mean one could never understand these texts if one just looked at it from one in a sense perspective of one empire. Yeah, if I, I you see the links between so to say these different textual genres, the different kind of the different kind of um, empires, and probably. This part, because here one could still say, I mean, as a Cambridge editor, yeah, but who knows these texts after all? I'm, I think so to say probably for a marketing strategy, uh, if one wants to kind of adopt the marketing strategy, um, I think probably it's the whole book, you know, looking at very different genres and very different times that is then probably um, even convincing to, um, to a Cambridge editor. I was just suggesting actually in another chapter, for instance, I talk about because Tanzania and Mozambique become then after independent socialist countries. Also again, so to say, this is a completely different cosmos of uh, very, so to say, socialist literature that circulates. And these are circulations like, for instance, lots of East African authors studied also in Eastern Germany in Berlin. And these are circulations that have not been much researched, um, if at all, so to say, for Africa. But there is lots of discussion at the moment about, so to say, the, the, the socialist and the Cold War links to other, um, to other parts of the world. So I guess it's this entanglement as well, just looking at it from another side of the world, um, you know, here it's also World War One. It's not like I, I don't think a Cambridge editor would ask which war are you talking about. Of course, there are many wars one could, <laughs> which are perfectly unknown in the West. But here, this is very much so to say. This is probably the crucial event of the 20th century, apart from World War Two. And here, however, it's a real shift of um, um, of perspective and kind of really. Uh, points out, so to say, to so many different um, uh, blind spots, I think, hopefully, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or looking at the diasporic novel, I mean, there's so much been written about that, but also, so to say, very often from looking at, at mostly Western, um, Western languages. So we are not, I'm, I'm trying not to fall into I mean, including lots of different uh, media and genres and, and so to say lots of different languages, but in a way also, I think it's this perspective of entanglement that it's another, so to say, worldly element to it, yeah, where we don't, I don't want to construct a small map or the small place and then say, I uh, look, and this is, so to say, this is the small and um, cozy home outside, so to say, of this big world, but it's rather really seeing the links that, that makes these um, um probably interesting yeah yeah i mean i mean abdul razak gornas as you're just mentioning i mean abdul razak gornas uh, last um, latest novel i mean afterlife is exactly the novel about world war one as well and and even so to say paradise talks a lot about the caravan trade where as well the colonizer in a sense only comes it's, it's there, colonization is there, but it's not the only force that shapes history. So history did not start um, 
uh, with colonial history, but it's there already and people are very much acting in a world drawing on very different kind of um, influences networks. I think that that's probably like really shifting the perspective that that is that probably one can make this argument now with Borna. <laughs> probably more convincing now. Yeah. Yeah, and his characters moving to East Germany as well. Actually, quite a lot. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Francesca and, and Clarissa. And just thank you all uh, for coming today and for your, your wonderful questions and comments. And, and most thanks, of course, to Clarissa uh, for presenting such a brilliant paper and such a thought-provoking and fascinating talk. Um, that was brilliant and uh, really, really uh, certainly thought thought provoking for me, uh, and I'm sure everyone else here. So, so thank you, Cl uh, Clarissa. And um, well, thank yeah. you, thank you to all of you also for the very interesting um, um, questions and um, the beautiful conversation, which uh, will continue. I hope. Thank you. Thanks, thank Clarissa. You. Thank you. Thank and thanks, everyone. I hope you have a, a, a lovely rest of your evening. So nice to see everyone as well. Bye now. Take care.